You are listening to the Free to Be Mindful podcast, which invites you along on a journey to learn of mindful living, grow in mental health, and inspire through personal growth. In a world where we can often feel much stress and overwhelm, this podcast provides bite-sized tips and real talk conversations, empowering you to embrace mindfulness and nurture your full potential. I'm your host, Vanessa de Jesus Guzman, educator, licensed professional counselor, entrepreneur, and mom. I'm passionate about helping others live life with peace of mind and ease of heart without losing their, well, you know, here we go. Hello and welcome to episode 167 of the Free to Be Mindful podcast. I hope that you're feeling good, looking good, and doing better in this world than you were yesterday. So it's so funny that despite it being two years since I've last worked in public education, my brain still functions on a school schedule. Now, don't get me wrong. (laughs) I don't get up as early as I used to, but I still run, my brain still runs on a school calendar. I used to joke that the month of October is everything month. And in addition to it being breast cancer awareness, it's also school violence prevention month, domestic violence awareness month, red ribbon week having to do with drug awareness towards the end of the month, bus safety month, and specifically in the state of New Jersey, the first week of October is designated as the week of respect, which focuses on the importance of addressing and preventing bullying. And this came from the Anti-Bullying Bill of Rights Act around 2010 or so. So during the first week of October and throughout the entire month, all schools, public schools in the state of New Jersey are mandated to bring awareness to bullying prevention. Now, I'll have to tell you first and foremost that I really dislike using the B word, bullying, that is. And that is because I used to be the anti-bullying prevention specialist. What a title, right? So anytime that a student thought that they experienced or witnessed an act of bullying, we used to have to do this entire investigation to see if the action was indeed bullying. Then we have to write up a whole report and that would go to the Board of Education. And then after that, the parents would be informed to see if their child was indeed a victim of bullying or an aggressor of bullying. It was this whole big to do to address kindness or or lack thereof. And it was definitely very important. It just made the role of being a school counselor a little bit foggy when you weren't supposed to be getting kids in trouble, but yet you had to do this whole investigation, which sounded as if you were working for a state police department or something like that. And when we think about it, one of the greatest gifts that us humans have is the ability to feel some form of genuine connections. My dog can do that too, but it's not quite the same as actually talking with another human and building these genuine connections. And the power of kindness can go a long way. And I'm sure we've all had times when a helping hand or a genuine smile changed our day. But just like our words and actions can impact us positively and be used to heal and to bring good into the world, when used incorrectly, they can also hurt and hinder our growth or that of others. When we were little kids, most of us, I'm sure, have had some kinds of experience with bullying, or as I like to call it, because again, I don't like that word, I like to call it mistreatment. And it's super important, though, for us to understand and help our kids to understand that not everything is bullying. So for example, there's teasing, which can be friendly teasing if going positively in both directions. And that is different from conflict, which is a normal part of everyday life, which is different than harassment, intimidation, and bullying. And the fact is, though, that whether it was being teased for the way that we looked or dressed or feeling intimidated or hurt by someone else or facing some form of harassment... The harsh reality is, especially as kids, not everyone was kind to us during our growth journey. And with bullying or with mistreatment, it can look different because it can be physical, emotional, or even something that might be disguised as a hurtful joke. We know that that can make us feel sad, vulnerable, and even lonely. And we as adults know that even though it's important to teach our kids that bullying and mistreatment is not okay, and help them understand that it all has repercussions, 
it can also have an impact on our own adult well-being. And it can be difficult to actually gauge every situation and interaction because the truth is, unfortunately, that some people can just be mean or have jerky behavior, as I sometimes like to say. We typically, in our places of employment, unless you're an entrepreneur, typically we do spend a lot of time with the same group of people. But because we're adults, we no longer fall into this physical pattern of kids like roughhousing or outwardly calling each other names or any of the things that we may relate or connect bullying in childhood. So sometimes as adults, we no longer talk about how bullying can affect us or impact us as adults, but it really can hurt us regardless of what age we are. Because the fact is that we can still experience mistreatment as adults. And it sounds a little bit odd to hear, but it is indeed true. I'll share with you that about 10 years ago or so, I experienced this in the workplace. And it wasn't, as I just mentioned, outward in the sense that I wasn't called names or I wasn't, you know, cursed that outwardly or anything like that but it was intentional and it was indeed emotional mistreatment that had a huge negative impact on me, unfortunately. And of course, I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty details, but I will share that from what potentially may have started as a comparison in work output, let's say, and maybe in a difference in how coworkers perceived a particular colleague and me, it resulted in ongoing instances where I was intentionally excluded, where untruths were told about me to higher ups, which impacted the way I was perceived to others, where information was intentionally not shared with me so that I would come to meetings and look unprepared. And as a result of these type of actions, and trust me, there's so many more types of examples than just the few that I mentioned, but I'll leave it at that. As a result of this, my workplace felt uncomfortable. And for a number of years, I hated going to work. And I don't like using that word. But the fact is that I hated attending my job every single day. Now, I loved the work that I was doing. And I loved working with students. But I stopped interacting with other colleagues because of the actions that were taking place. Because when walking into a situation and then feeling the room feel tense, I didn't know what untruths were being shared and again, how others were perceiving me. And that did a lot to my internal self-talk. Because prior to these things happening, this person and I were very friendly. And then they changed and they became very negative and very skeptical. And being surrounded by this type of talk and behavior day in and day out impacted me that when I started thinking about myself and my abilities, and when I would think of a new idea, I would then doubt myself a gazillion times over for fear of what this person would say or think, and for fear of what others would say or think, or how the idea was being received, or was I coming off as a show-off because I was perceived as you know putting on a show? The amount of mental energy that was put out on this situation was so draining. It was not good for my mental health. And it took years, literally years, to learn to replace this type of self-talk and this type of thinking with more positive self-talk and thinking. And who knows what the reason was to start all of this behavior, right? We might think to ourselves, what is it that happens when bullying occurs? What is the root thing of it all? In my case, again, I think it came from comparing and from thinking that I was trying to outdo somebody else. And I think that that may have been what ignited it all. I really don't know. But to understand what bullying is, I mean, it starts a little differently than with defining any other term, because for this, it really starts with not only looking at the situation that's taking place, but also taking a look at the aggressor, at the person who's doing these types of actions. Bullying can be used as an infliction of how people feel about themselves, or maybe traumatic situations that they once went through or are currently going through. Oftentimes, this can be a result of several factors like low self-esteem, learned aggressive behaviors, an urge to establish dominance in some way, jealousy, stress, emotional negligence, and maybe even being the victim of mistreatment at one point themselves. 
But whatever the trigger, it may come from a source of mental, emotional, or physical pain. And as a result, this can cause more of these emotions than someone else. And does understanding a bully's intention excuse your actions? No, it doesn't. Bullying can cause psychological and even physical harm, and it can create a really harmful environment for the person who is being bullied. And the truth is that it doesn't stop in the classroom or in the playground. We see it in the workplace. We see it with random strangers and even sometimes with our own family and friends. And we can see it in different ways, right? We may not see it as much in the physical sense as far as hitting, punching, kicking, you know, anything like that. And maybe we might see it with verbal, like calling somebody else names or insulting or threatening. But more often than not, I feel as though we see it a lot with social, with spreading rumors, with public humiliation, with, you know, setting up a situation that it causes the other person to look stupid. And we see it a lot. In cyberspace, sending hurtful comments or messages online, spreading rumors online, pretending to make up a fake profile and hurt someone else. And if something is said or done to you that makes you feel bad or puts you in a position or in a vulnerable place, there's a huge chance that it could fall under this umbrella of harassment, intimidation, or bullying. But as adults, though, we tend to brush this off because we think, well, we're no longer kids. Like words shouldn't hurt us this much and the actions of others shouldn't matter and we couldn't or shouldn't care that much. But the fact is that words do hurt and we can feel the impact of other people's actions. Of course we do, because at the end of the day, it isn't just about a young child or a grown adult that's being mistreated. It's about the human. And we're all humans. We all have these emotions. And yes, some of us may have a little bit thicker skin than others, but it doesn't mean that it feels good when we are on that receiving end. As adults, we still have our inner child too that wants to be nurtured and healed. And as humans, we need to feel that feeling of feeling safe and comfortable in our own skin and during our own journeys. And no matter who or what is causing the pain, We deserve to speak up about it if necessary. We deserve to remove the stigma that we, you know, feel embarrassed or that we shouldn't care. And we should try to understand what this mistreatment can look like beyond our school years. So one of the main ways to understand mistreatment in adulthood and prevent mistreatment from occurring is to be mindful in the ways that we interact with others about? Is what you're saying positive? Do we need to voice something if it's not kind? Is there a way that we can make our words sound a little bit softer? Are we making others feel uncomfortable? And what can we do to make the world a better place, even if it is for just one person? And I know that the arguments or the rebuttal to that may be, well, we have to get tougher skin and we should be resilient. And can that be true? Yeah, we can learn to have tougher skin and be resilient and overcome things. But does that allow us to do something mean on purpose just because we should have tougher skin? Those two things don't match. So yes, be resilient, but also don't make someone else's life impossible just because. Sometimes mistreatment can come from intention, right? Sometimes we don't see what our impact is, but sometimes the intention is there to have that end result. And this can come from a lack of emotional intelligence, which is understanding and managing emotions of ourselves and the people around us and having that social awareness, which highlights the ability to understand the perspective that others have. Both of these are key to understanding the responsibility that each one of us holds for our actions and making space for compassion, for diversity, and making space to have genuine relationships. And other times, things can be unintentional, right? We can learn to unlearn some behaviors because all of us, to some degree, use the, oh, I was just kidding, or it's not a big deal, that was just a joke. But it's no longer a joke when it isn't funny to the recipient and they feel hurt by what was said. Maybe something we did to hurt someone else requires us to take some time for reflection. And maybe that deserves an honest apology. 
if we experience mistreatment from someone else, it can be easy to want to slip back into these same behaviors because after all, there's the saying that hurt people hurt people. But when we're able to recognize some of these behaviors and find out positive ways on how we can respond instead of negatively react, then we can drive change in a positive direction. And as parents, we can be there for our kids by having the conversations and providing support whether it's having conversations with teachers, with school counselors, talking to our kids about coping mechanisms and giving them a shoulder to lean on, expressing why mistreatment is not okay, even when you're mad, and teaching our kids how to set boundaries with others and how to be assertive without being mean. We can start implementing these prevention techniques so that when they become adults, they can then do the same thing in a healthy way. So if you yourself are experiencing some kind of work harassment, intimidation, mistreatment, or bullying, talk to someone, whether it's a friend, a partner, a therapist, anyone who can help you process your emotions and figure out how to respond appropriately. Communication is key. It's important to not fight fire with fire, but instead communicate in a way that is kind, but assertive and firm. Disengage when needed, and if possible, when we see things or are told something by someone in passing, think about how we may not have to give them access to us. We can choose to limit what impacts us when we have some control over it and who has a space in our lives. And as the challenger, we can sometimes use hurtful language or do things that make someone else feel small or uncomfortable. And in instances like this, it's important to remember, are we exercising compassion? How would we feel if someone did this to us? Can we look inward and perhaps change the situation? For example, if we're becoming a challenger because we're stressed or sad or angry, maybe we can work on these root emotions first so that they don't impact the way that we interact with others. And take accountability. Our words and actions have consequences, and sometimes we need to be the ones to check our own selves, to apologize, to change the narrative, to work on some personal things and whatever else we have to do to be okay with others. And then as a person who is being challenged, we can also experience fear, sadness, guilt, and a lot of other heavy emotions. We start to wonder, what is it that we did wrong? Why is it that this is happening? Are we deserving of these actions? And sometimes mistreatment doesn't even involve us, but we can be a bystander. And we can perpetuate that mistreatment by not speaking up with others. Instead of seeing silence, let's say, we can practice empathy, intervene in situations and provide support as needed. So my friends, at the end of every podcast episode, I always lead you on a guided meditation. Have you ever thought, am I doing this right? Is this how it really gets done? I personally use something that tells me if I am actually in a meditative state and that thing is called Muse. The headband is equipped with monitors that read your heart rate, your brain waves, tells you exactly when you're in an active, neutral, or calm state. It's super easy to use. You turn it on, you place it on your head, and you link it to the app. And the app has a ton of guided meditations that you can choose from. Not only do I use it on my own, but I also use it with clients as young as five years old. By using the Muse, you get all of the benefits that meditation gives you, like feeling calmer and more relaxed, having more focus and clarity, being better able to handle stress and being more in tune with your emotions. But you're also going to have that biofeedback in your hands that tells you if you're actually doing it right. And what I love the most is that it really helps you with your sleep. You can get the Muse for your own home at a discounted rate by turning to the link in the show notes below. I hope it's as great for you as it is for me. Being on the receiving end of mistreatment can be a very difficult experience. There are emotional scars, a lack of self-confidence, conflicts that ends up um, building in us, and a lack of inclusivity or respect. and a lot of other serious things. So remember that story that I started with at the start of the podcast? It took a long time. 
to get over that. It took a long time to get over that emotionally, but also mentally and to step out of that narrative, to put that aside and to create a new one for myself. We see things in the workplace and sometimes we fear speaking up because we think that we're going to lose our job or that it's going to impact a relationship. Or maybe if we tell a friend about, you know, something that was said or hurtful, we might lose that friend. The truth is our safety and well-being isn't something to be compromised. We all deserve to be able to speak up without worrying about what will happen to us. And a good workplace should help us grow. A true friendship wouldn't end just because we had a hard conversation. Because when we stand up for ourselves and receive the right support, we can get past that mistreatment. And as someone who's experienced this mistreatment, as someone who's a mother, a partner, and a friend, I know that it hurts seeing people you care about being mistreated. But the good news is with the right supports, the right awareness, and the right mindset, we can take action. I now invite you to join me on this short guided meditation. So right now, regardless of where you are or what you're doing, I invite you to reflect on an experience you may have had, whether perhaps you were the target or the aggressor of mistreatment. Despite on what end you were on, think about the impact that you may have had or the impact that was done on you. Whether this experience happened when you were in middle school or whether it happened just last week at work, take a moment to reflect on this. Is this how you want to live? Is this how you want to be defined as? Is this the best version of yourself? Know that you are the only one who decides how you want to be remembered, how you want others to think of you. Know that you can redefine yourself at any moment you choose. Reflect on where you are, think about where you want to go, and make the steps to achieve this new reality. And remember, in a world where we are free to be anything that we want to be, we are always free to be mindful. Have a great week.